Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Horace Crail. Crail, uh, does Mr. Crail know Mr. Wolf? Oh, I see. What is it, Archie? A guy named Horace Crail. His secretary says he wants to talk to you. What about? I don't know. Us? Uh, Mr. Wolf's rather busy right now, but I'll give him a message if you wish. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. Mr. Wolf. What? Black on red and red on black. Archie, this is solitaire. So? Solitaire is a game that is played by one single person alone. If I wish to put a red card on a red card or a black card on a black card... You're cheating. Of course I am cheating. What is the message Mr. Horace Crail, secretary, asks you to convey? Just that he wants to see you. In a rather tragic sense, I suppose he does. Why tragic? In that he wants to see me. He is blind. Tell him to come here at his own convenience. Okay. Uh, what does Mr. Crail want to see Mr. Wolf about? A murder? A murder that may still be prevented. Archie. Uh, just a second. What? I have run the cards out perfectly. Is it his own murder Mr. Crail wants us to prevent? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Once in a long while, Mr. Wolf and I talk about this affair. When we do, we call it the case of the lost heir. But I don't think the title's quite adequate. For me, it ought to be called the case of a gone goose. And I was the goose. Well, Archie, do you see any red on red or black on black? Nope. So? So what? You irritate me, Archie. Okay, you won your little game of solitaire perfectly, as you say. Now, who is Horace Crail? A prominent industrialist. If you read the papers, you would know. Horace Crail. Crail? Oh, yeah, the Crail Company. Exactly. How did you know he was blind, if he is? The papers have carried the story. The headlines read, Blind Father Welcomes Lost Daughter. Oh, yeah, I remember. A few days ago, there was a picture, too. <laughs> I thought you'd remember the girl, at least. Well, if it's the one I remember, I remember. Archie. Oh, well, it probably isn't true. By the way, let me tell you what I found out about the facts of life. The door, Archie. Mr. Crail is here to see Mr. Wolf. Oh, yes, come in. This is Mr. Crail. I'm his secretary, Hugh Gaines. Uh, there's a step here, Mr. Crail. Of course. Uh, who is this man? I'm Archie Goodwin, Mr. Wolf's assistant. Mr. Wolf's waiting for you. Where is Mr. Wolf, Mr. Goodwin? I led the way. The blind man and his secretary followed. Mr. Horace Crail was tall, thin, white-haired. His face was heavily lined, but the lines were not those of care or worry. He wore very dark glasses through which he might not have been able to see, even if he had had his sight. Hugh Gaines, the secretary, was in his late twenties. Surprisingly young and surprisingly handsome for the kind of a job he had. I led them into Mr. Wolfe's office, made the introductions, and sat them down. Well, Mr. Crail, what can I do for you? As you see, Mr. Wolf, I'm blind. Need I say you have my deepest sympathy? I don't give a hoot for your sympathy, Mr. Wolf. Oh, uh, thank you, of course. I mentioned my condition merely because it affects the position in which I find myself. Go on. Uh, you. Yes, Mr. Crail? Tell Mr. Wolf about my daughter. Oh, incidentally, Mr. Wolf, I asked my secretary to do this because in this way you will get a first hand account. Now, let's see. A few days ago, Tuesday to be exact, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, a young woman walked into the house and said she wanted to see her father. I spoke to her myself. She said her name was Magda Crail. I asked her certain questions. Why, Mr. Gaines? He asked her questions because he thought, and I, I thought, that my daughter died 13 years ago. Oh, either the girl who came back to me is my daughter, or she is an imposter. 
and she belongs in jail. Is there any doubt in your mind about it? Of course. That's why I'm here. On the telephone, you said something about preventing murder. Well, I, uh, I have a stepson named Anthony George to whom I intended to leave my money. Not because I liked him. <laughs> Simply because I had nobody else to leave it to. Except your daughter. Except my daughter. If she is my daughter. We were talking about murder. I was talking about my daughter and my stepson. Uh, same thing, I think. Maybe, possibly. I, I don't know. Mr. Crail. Yes? I am not a wealthy man, but I am certainly able to make ends meet. Yeah. What do you mean? Explain, Archie. I think Mr. Wolf means that if you don't want to be frank with him, he'd rather not waste his time. Mr. Wolf, I apologize if I've seemed to spar with you. Fooey. See, a blind man can only judge by what he hears and smells and feels. So? No, sir. I must be a little more cautious than I would have to be uh, otherwise. I'm sorry, Mr. Crail. Patience is not one of my virtues. Now, about your daughter or your non-daughter. What's her name? Magda. She calls herself Magda Crail, which, of course, was my daughter's name. What makes you think she isn't your daughter? Well, ten million dollars, partly. Uh, once again, Mr. Crail? My estate may be worth more than that, but uh, surely not less. You? Surely not less, Mr. Crail. Rather more, I should say. Yes, ten million might have some appeal to an ambitious girl, eh, Archie? Sure, but I'm not a girl, and I'm not ambitious. Nobody could accuse you of either four. Mr. Crail, we are getting nowhere. Either you tell your story from the beginning or take it somewhere else. Archie, I'd like some beer. When I went out for the beer, the kitchen was a mess, and incidentally, I saw what was being prepared for lunch. When I got back to the office, Mr. Crail and his boy were gone. One beer for Mr. Wolf. What happened? What took you so long, Archie? I had a sandwich. And spoiled your lunch. You know what you're having for lunch? Of course. I planned it. Baby octopus. Delicious. I'll take your word for it. What happened to the blind tycoon? Get your book, will you, Archie? I want to give you a few notes. Oh, just a second. Okay. Item. Item. You needn't repeat everything after me. Yes, master. Item. Horace Crail was born blind. Item, his wife and their six-year-old daughter, Magda, disappeared in their private plane 13 years ago. Magda returned last Tuesday. Item, no matter what he says to the contrary, Horace Crail is afraid he's going to be killed. I think Mr. Crail is right. Memo. From Archie Goodwin to Nero Wolf. Time, 4.32 p.m. The notes you dictated on the Crail case are on your blotter. Three pages of them. You are with your orchids. I am on my way to the Crail domicile to meet the other characters in this turgid drama. As per instructions, I will bring them here if possible. Love, Archie. Yes, sir? My name is Goodwin, Archie Goodwin, I believe I'm expected. In this way, please, sir. Don't tell me you're Nero Wolf. Not by a couple of hundred pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin, his assistant. Well, I'm Magda Crail. Nobody's assistant. That awful Hugh Gaines creature said Nero Wolf wants to talk to me. He does. Well, where is he? Waiting for you. No hurry, though. No hurry at all. Just, uh, just play and don't worry about a thing. Black hair, green eyes... Skin like a magnolia petal. Beautiful, beautiful. While she finished what she was playing, I watched her. Beautiful. Well? Beautiful. Mr. Goodwin. Archie. Oh, we could get along together, Archie, if that's the way you are. It's the way I am. I can't seem to do anything about it. Where's Anthony? Anthony? Oh, Anthony George. Well, I thought both my repulsive half-brother and I were supposed to meet Nero Wolf. I'm here in case anybody wants to know. Over there in the shadows, listening with all his ears, that's Anthony George. 
Shall we go and talk to Nero Wolf, Anthony? Goodwin, you look like a normal sort of person. Well, that's open to question, but go on. If you had to choose between $10 million and killing a woman by due process of law, which would you choose? I'll think about it between now and July 1994. Now, shall we go talk to Nero Wolf? Miss Crea. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Why did you wait until now, until last Tuesday, to let your father know that you were living? Does it make any difference? I think so. Thirteen years ago, I was six. What she means is that she was six when she died. But I didn't die, Anthony Sweet. Obviously. But Magda Crail did. With my mother. His mother. Anthony says he doesn't remember me as a child. But I remember him, the brat. What about me? When I was about four or five, you were eight or nine, I suppose, do you remember dressing up in one of Daddy's tailcoats, a sword, and Mother's hat with a plume? Suppose I did. You're still not my sister. Don't worry, Anthony. When poor father dies, I'll support you. Archie. Sir? I made a mistake. A mistake? You? I thought I wanted to talk to these young people. I don't. Take them away. Take the young lady to a nightclub. On my salary? As part of our investigation, it will be charged to Mr. Horace Crail. It was no hardship at all. In fact, it was a pleasure. We dropped Anthony George off at the Crail place, and Magda and I went on. And on. You're a wonderful dancer, Archie. You can't make enemies that way, honey. Archie, why did Mr. Wolf want you to take me out? To find out whether you really are Crail's daughter. How did he expect you to find out? I don't know. You think he knew? He probably had some idea, but I don't know what it could have been. Honestly? Honestly. Archie... Do you think I'm telling the truth? No. But wait a minute, baby. I I don't think you're lying, either. I just don't think. Give me my handbag, Archie. Thanks. I've got something here that might interest both you and Mr. Wolf. Here. Those are snapshots that were taken of me before I was six. Ah. Yeah, cute. Now look at me. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, can't you see those pictures are of me? Kids that young all look the same to me, but... Uh... Suppose they are pictures of you. What of it? Well, just this. I found them in one of Mr. Crail's old photograph albums. My father, I mean. Oh, here's something. The one lying on my tummy on the white bearskin rug. All babies get their pictures taken that way. You give it to Wait me. a second. What's this mark under your shoulder blade? Well, it's a little birthmark, like a strawberry. Ah, it's clear. Uh, look, honey. Why are you so interested in babies, Archie? Because I always thought I should have been a mother. Now, look, have you still got that mark on your back? At least I suppose so. They don't go away, do they? Where are you going? I'll be right back. Nero Wolf speaking. Archie Goodwin. I'm with Magda Crail. No doubt. What? No doubt, I said. But never mind. What do you want? I want to ask a question. Go on. You don't think Magda's Horace Crail's daughter, do you? I don't think anything. You're stealing your lines from me. Never. All right, then, no. I don't think the girl is Crail's daughter. That's just what I hoped you'd say. Why, Archie? Because for once, you're wrong. She's pretty, isn't she? Yes, she is. Also, she's got a birthmark. You have seen it? No, but nobody's going to be fool enough to claim a birthmark. It isn't there. It's too easy to prove. Good night, Archie. deserted me, Archie. Well, you know Hugh Gaines, don't you? Hello, Gaines. Hello, Goodwin. Making hay while the moon shines? You know, if you work that into a routine, it could be pretty dull. You don't like me, do you? Do I have to? No. No, not in the least. Well, that's good. Mr. Wolf and I feel it's wrong to like any of our clients, especially in nightclubs. Really? Why? Because they might sit down at your table while you're making a telephone call. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Never I... mind. Finish your drink. Once again, I'm sorry. Forget it. Mr. Crail seems to think that uh, Magna's trying to rook him. Apparently. What do you think? Boys, I'm here too, you know. Quiet. What do you think, Mr. Gaines? Well, to me, it's a matter of no importance one way or the other. As for Mr. Crail, what he wants is absolute proof. And, of course, there's no such thing as proof that is absolute. Do you want me to add it up for you? Yeah. That's exactly what I want you to do for me. Add it up. 
13 years ago, Mrs. Crail and her small daughter, Magda, boarded a chartered plane in St. Louis to fly across the Ozarks to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. They took off, and that's the last that ever was heard of them, or the pilot, or the plane. Okay, add some more. Mr. Crail had the whole area searched for months. The search itself cost almost $50,000. And the plane was not found. They finally decided that it must have fallen into the Mississippi, where it would sink to the bottom and uh, stay forever. Now, wait a minute. Magda. Yes, Archie? Don't you remember anything about this trip? Nothing. Not a single thing. The last I remember is Mother putting me to bed in a strange city, in a hotel. And that's all. Okay, what's the next thing you remember? Archie, dear. Yeah? Didn't my father go over this whole business with Mr. Wolfe? I suppose he did. Then do we have to do it again? There must be some reason why he wanted me to take you to a nightclub. Because I might say something I haven't already said a hundred times? Maybe. What's the next thing you remember after your mother put you to bed in a strange city? Archie, I have a confession to make. This I believe. Go ahead. Ten million dollars is a lot of money. So I've been told. I don't really remember a single solitary thing before I was six years old and going to school in Rogers, Arkansas. Not Anthony George wearing tails and a sword? It was one of the pictures in the album. Not your mother putting you to bed in a hotel in St. Louis? Ten million dollars, Archie. So you're not Magda Crail. Well, of course I'm Magda Crail. Oh, I may have tried to make the story sound a little more convincing than I should have. But I'm Magda Crail just the same. How could I be anybody else? And so far, I can't see why you shouldn't be anybody else. Miss Crail will now bring up the matter of the diary. Won't you, Miss Crail? The diary? Oh, you don't know. Then Mr. Wolf has told you nothing at all about this case, has he? He probably told me all I needed to know. What about a diary? Well, you see, Mr. Goodwin, Miss Crail's memory begins at about the happy age of seven. A black-haired, green-eyed, pigtail brat named Maggie Lomax. Only child of Walt and Mabel Lomax of Rogers, Arkansas. Am I correct, Miss Lomax? Uh, Miss Crail, I mean. He's a sarcastic character, isn't he, Archie? That he is, that he is. What about this diary? To cut a long sob story short, Walt and Mabel Lomax died in an automobile accident a few weeks ago, leaving uh, only Maggie. Take it from there, Maggie. There was no money. I looked through the house to find anything I could sell, and I came across a hidden box. The diary was in the box, along with some clothes that might fit a six-year-old girl. The clothes look like what the girl was last seen wearing. How do you know? <laughs> well, there's a photograph of one of Mr. Crail's albums taken in St. Louis the day before the flight. But for uh, ten million, those clothes could be reproduced. Stitch for stitch. Archie, dear. Take him out in the alley. It would be a pleasure. <laughs> oh, now, wait a second, Archie. With one arm tied behind you, I think you could probably beat me into a pulp. Is it all right if we uh, don't prove it? We were talking about the diary, Archie. Okay, what about it? Archie, I don't even claim the handwriting is mine. What's handwriting when you're six years old? Still... The first page is one of those things that has name, name of parents, home address, and like that. Color of hair, eyes, you know. Sure, I had one myself. Certainly. Every child had one. One or a dozen. Maybe they still do. You fill in the first page and then you never write another word. Honey. They were cheap. I doubt if they cost a quarter. And there was a place that said, my first date, favorite pastor. Look, baby. Oh, he calls me baby, Mr. Gaines. Yes, I noticed that. I think he'd believe your story no matter what you told him. Get lost, will you, Mr. Gaines? What's that? Get lost. Drop dead. Turn blue. Well, I can take a hint. Good night, Archie. And Miss Lomax. Prissy, isn't he? Prissy is the word. He doesn't seem to believe your story. He believes what he's told to believe. It's his job. Sure. You believe me, don't you, Archie? Honey, you're beautiful. Just the way you are. Now, let's talk about the diary. I hate you. I hate you, too. Shall we dance? The diary. Oh, dear. Where is it? Do you call this romance? No, I call it working overtime. Where is it? Here, in my handbag. Here. Push over. We look at it together. I'm not crowding you, am I? What's a little crowding? Cozy, isn't it? Now, look at the cover first. My diary, 1934. I suppose somebody gave it to me for my sixth birthday. Let's just not suppose anything, shall we? All right, Archie. Page one. Name, Magda Crail. Date of birth, October 11th, 1928. But you read it. Or can you read? Anything you can write, honey. Uh, date of birth and so on. Father Horace Crail, Mother Mabel Crail. Hair black, eyes green. My favorite pastime, playing with dolls. Playing has a Y in it. You know what I think, Archie. 
You wouldn't call that writing, would you? Not real writing. It's more like printing. I think my mother guided my hand when I wrote that. Yeah, that's the way it looks, all right. Well... Dance now? Dance now. While we danced, while I held that disturbing girl in my arms, I tried to believe the case was just as simple as it seemed. Somehow she'd survived a plane crash, a head injury, and then a normal life with a couple who naturally wouldn't tell her that she wasn't really theirs. I tried to believe it. I was trying hard when... Archie, don't look. There's Anthony George. Oh, yeah, alone in the corner. You've had a lot of experience, Archie. Do you think he's a killer? A what? Do you think he'd commit murder? I don't think anything about him, but why should he? For ten million dollars? I see what you mean. Are you worried? Not with you around, Archie. Not with you around. It was like that, maybe even more like that, until the waiter told me I was wanted on the telephone. I asked her to keep the table warm, that I'd be right back. Archie Goodwin. Archie? Oh, hello, Mr. Wolf. I've been talking to Mr. Crail. Wonderful. A little less humor, perhaps? Okay, what about Mr. Crail? He showed me some pictures of his daughter. Baby pictures? Unfortunately. Some of the pictures were missing from the album. Those are the ones I've been looking at. Archie, I'm interested in that birthmark. So am I. Do you think you could persuade the young lady to have a picture taken of her back undraped? Wait a minute. Just one moment. Well? You mean that? Clear picture in a bright light. How would you like her posed, Mr. Wolf? I am not amused, Archie. Okay, I'm sorry. All I want is a clear, sharp, focused picture of that birthmark. And I expect you to get it for me. <laughs> Good night, Archie. <laughs> Lots more. What now? That birthmark. So I've got a birthmark. What about it? I wish I had one that was worth ten million. So do I. But this one is worth nothing to me. Since my father doesn't believe I'm his daughter, and he's blind, that kind of identification doesn't mean anything to him. You're forgetting the people he trusts. Hugh Gaines, for instance. If the birthmark is there, couldn't he look at it, compare it with those awful baby pictures, and say, yes, here is your daughter? I've got news for you, Archie. He has looked at it. He says it looks the same as the one in the baby pictures. Has he told your father that? Yes. But he also told him he thought I was a fake. That somehow I found out that the six-year-old daughter of a millionaire had died in a plane crash 13 years ago. And I found out she had a strawberry birthmark on her back. And I had one, too. So I decided to say that I was Magda Crail. That's absurd. Of course it is. You can see how it's going to work out, can't you, Archie? Frankly, no. How? My father went to Mr. Wolf simply to have him prove that I am his daughter. Whatever Hugh Gaines says. The only thing I'm afraid of, though... What are you afraid of, baby? I'm afraid my darling half-brother might kill him... before he has a chance to change his will. Isn't that a somewhat mercenary view to take of the matter? Maybe it is, Archie. And maybe I'd feel differently about it... if my father had found me instead of waiting for me to find him. He tried, didn't he? I wonder. Let's get back to that birthmark. Are you allergic to floodlights? I know a photographer who has a studio. Confound it, Archie. How did you know it was going to be me? Because nobody else would dare to call me this late. What do you want? I got the pictures. They're drying now. If you come home, bring them with you. They may be important tomorrow. Have you heard that Horace Crail was murdered? No. How? Who? Where? Tomorrow we'll talk about it, Archie. Good night. At 4 p.m. the next day, there was quite a lot of confusion in Nero Wolf's office. At his direction, I'd set up a picture screen at one end of the room, and on his desk at the other end, a rather strangely constructed projector. At 4.30, the guests arrived. Magda, Anthony, George, Hugh Gaines, and, of course, Inspector Kramer ready to make an arrest if he could figure out whom to arrest. 
Hello, Inspector. Hi, Goodwin. Magda, Anthony Hello, George, Hello. you. Yeah, Mr. what's Goodwin. this all about? Uh, what's going on, Archie? You got me, Inspector. I think Mr. Wolf wants to show slides of his trip to Yellowstone Park. But here he is. Ask him. Oh, say, Wolf, you want to know what I think? Not in the least, Inspector. Sit down somewhere, won't you? Mm. Archie, will you turn out the lights? Thank you. Now, this is a picture of Magda Crail lying on her stomach at the age of six months. I changed the focus so, and we have a close-up of a birthmark. A smooth discoloration that looks as if it might have been painted on. Now, look, Wolf. You said if I came here, you'd give me the guy who killed Horace Crail. And you show me a picture of a baby's back. Inspector, if you open your mouth again, I may not keep my promise. Go ahead. While we look at this enlargement of a birthmark on baby's back, let us remember that the late Mr. Horace Crail was blind and never saw it. So what? What's he getting at, Goodwin? Inspector, if I knew, I'd tell you. Listen. Mr. Crail had a trusted secretary, Hugh Gaines. I'm here. Of course. Mr. Gaines had a brilliant idea. He knew the tragedy of Mrs. Crail and her daughter, and he decided to bring Crail's daughter back to life. What makes you think so, Mr. Wolfe? You had access to the photograph album and only you. Oddly enough, Mr. Crail didn't even know his daughter had a birthmark until you told him. That may be true, but what of it? It's unimportant. Now I want to show you another picture. Archie, explain this picture, will you? A reading from left to right, this is a picture of Miss Crail's back. Very pretty, too. As you can see, there is what appears to be a small birthmark, somewhat under the left shoulder blade. I change focus... And as it becomes larger... That's not a birthmark. That's tattooing. You can see it. Tattooing, of course. And Mr. Gaines had a brilliant idea. How to make use of a tattooed birthmark and Miss Magna to help him out. Blind as he was, Horace Crail saw through it. That's why Hugh Gaines had to kill him. No, you don't, Gaines. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolfie, all right? Of course I'm all right. Well, Inspector Kramer, Mr. Gaines is your man. Another bottle of beer, please, Archie. It's right there in front of you. You know, I was thinking, a girl can get herself tattooed, can't she? Is that a crime? What does it prove? Archie, Archie. Have I ever told you I love you? <laughs> I'm going to bed. Good night, Archie. <sighs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Mindred Lord was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadden production produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Martha Shaw, Vic Rodman, Peter Leeds, Gray Stafford, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you the case in room 304. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah brings you another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show, starring Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Joan Davis, Fran Warren, and many more. And this Sunday's Theater Guild on the Air production is the Broadway comedy The First Year. Starring in this Theater Guild presentation are Richard Widmark and Catherine Grayson. Remember, Tallulah Bankhead stars in her wonderful big show Sunday on NBC.